Hi, thanks for watching. Okay, in this video, I'd like to talk about how and why psychology and, and therapy did not work for me. Okay, and I, I'm sorry, I, I don't really want to be criticizing psychology, and, uh, and maybe, maybe, there's, maybe psychology is maybe improving with their theory of, of personality disorders. So maybe, maybe we're just not, we're not far from a better day for, for those who want to seek uh, psychotherapy and, and, uh, and maybe, you know, waiting for psychology maybe to improve their, their theories of cluster B uh, personality disorders. But I just want to uh, try to explain how exactly why um, and I've been thinking about this, okay, exactly why and how um, the, my therapy experience uh, didn't work for me. And of course, I'm just hoping things get better. I'm, I'm just talking about my experience. And also just, it's my feedback in a way for those who may also be struggling in a similar way. Okay. All right. So, okay. When I was in therapy, I had no trouble understanding the, the DSM symptoms. Okay. I had no one, a trouble understanding. I knew what arrogance was. Okay. I knew what um, empathy was, okay, or what a lack of empathy was. I really did. I really did have a sense of that. I really did understand, you know, about fantasies of unlimited success and all these, you know, the envy and all that. And frankly, you know, that wasn't that wasn't what was hard for me, okay. What was hard for me was to understand how to deal with it, okay, or what to do about it, okay. And I guess. How would I say this? I'm not really into computers and I'm not really a, a math oriented person, but I always have this idea that you really don't understand something until you get under the hood. OK, so like say if my if my car is pulling to the left, I'm, I'm not satisfied by just pulling to the right. OK, I want to know what's happening in the suspension and in the actual um, the frame of the car that's making it turn so I can go to the root cause. OK, so like. I guess when I was uh, in therapy, I just wasn't satisfied that, okay, I just don't have empathy. It's like, but why? You know what I mean? Like, why don't I have empathy? Okay. Or like, um, you know, arrogance, envy, like, but why? What is it just, is it just something that just exists or is there a reason for it? What's happening down under the hood that I can work on instead of directly fighting the symptoms, you know, because it just didn't, you know, years and years, decades. And I was not able to really uh, make any meaningful advancement. So, you know, I have to almost say that, you know, accepting and acknowledging the DSM symptoms to me, you know, honestly, it's it almost doesn't even seem really like self-awareness, to be quite honest, because I think there's something deeper going on. And frankly, you know, I think there are probably a lot of good psychologists that probably have a good idea, but just they, it just doesn't come out in the therapy. For some reason, the therapy model is just sit there, you know, give no feedback basically, and just talk and free association. And it's just, it just, to me, it's just, I don't know, it was very frustrating to me and, and it didn't work for me. Okay. And, you know, again, I'm hoping things get better. I'm hoping maybe we're entering a new, a new era in therapy. Everything's free. Psychologists are free to change. Psychology is free to evolve. I hope so. Okay. But basically, um, here's the thing. Okay. During all of the years of me trying to figure out NPD, okay, understanding empathy, understanding arrogance, understanding all these things, it never really occurred to me what was happening underneath, what was happening, brew, what was brewing underneath to make these symptoms, okay? So basically, um, it was only like in the last couple of years, okay, really, that it occurred to me that maybe, okay, the lack of empathy, just as one example, the lack of empathy is really because of something overactive. So it's not really something missing, but it's there's something in me that's maybe hyperactive that may be causing the lack of empathy. I mean, I started I started thinking backwards because I'm thinking like it can't be so simple. Like I'm just missing something. Maybe there's something in me that's that's revving too intense that's actually suppressing the empathy. You know what I mean? So I, I started kind of thinking backwards, and then as far as like say the arrogance and the grandiosity and all that. I, it took me even longer, you know, but, but I, and I have been thinking about it, but it, but it also seemed to me that that was coming out of a kind of hyperactivity. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay. Basically, um, I want to introduce a couple terms in this video and I apologize if this is frustrating, but, um, basically I think there's a term that comes out of, there's a term that comes out of philosophy, which is called dialectic, dialectical. Okay. Dialectic, dialectical. Okay, the dialectic in philosophy, okay, is basically 
how we reconcile and confront and deal with and process how we address contradictions in life. Okay, that's how you advance a conversation, basically. So basically, what do I mean by that? Contradictions. Okay, so like say, um, let's say um, um, a typical contradiction. Like say, I love my mother, and then in other moments, I hate my mother. How do you reconcile those contradictions? Those are most normal people can reconcile contradictory positions, contradictory situations, and you sort of address and process those things. Okay, so that's kind of a dialectical process. Maybe another dialectical process would be, you know, ideological. Okay, like. The, the job of a government is to put their priority on the weakest citizens. The most vulnerable citizens should be prioritized. Okay. Another ideology is we need to invest, um, we, we need to invest our attention and efforts on the strongest people. Okay. The strongest people need more attention and, and, and they need to be sort of favored because they will trickle down their success and the weaker people will benefit. You know, we've seen these things. These are, these are contradictory positions. And in the space of politics or in the space of philosophy or in the space of academics, people sort of reconcile these sort of opposing ideas and they get into the reconciliation. Okay, so that's dialectic. Dialectical process is I, the idea is that when you have two opposing ideas through reconciliation, you sort of advance into kind of an evolution that's sort of like a blending, sort of like, um, how would you say, like the, the reconciliation produces a more... Um, a more advanced way of thinking. Okay, so that's that's a very simple way of describing dialectic. Okay, but another way that I think psychologically that we could describe dialectic would be the reconciliation of dissonances. Okay, dissonances. Okay, the reconciliation of things that are dissonant and frustrating. Okay, or things that are irritating. Okay, so basically in psychology, if we want to. We could talk about um, dialectic as our reconciliation and processing of, yeah, contradictory, but also frustrating, irritating, dissonant experiences, okay? And that's very important because, um, like I said before, like I came to this idea that maybe, maybe all the things that we're lacking in narcissism really come from a hyperactivity, okay? And also the grandiosities and all the other things also come from a hyperactivity, but how, how would that be, okay? So basically, um, I heard one psychologist say, and it was from a video that, that was like almost 10 years ago, okay? He said that all the cluster B disorders are arousal disorders, okay? So this is important. Psychologists apparently have known for a long time that, um, that the cluster B disorders are arousal disorders, okay? But where in the DSM criteria does it talk about arousal? It's very interesting, right? And I'm thinking to myself, that would have really helped me. <laughs> you know, it's like, why don't they, why don't they let more out of the bag? Like there are psychologists who know perfectly well that cluster B is an arousal dysfunction. My God, that would have helped me, you know? And, and I, I mean, okay, so I, it took me a long time to figure that out, but, uh, but I also agree. I agree that the, the main issue is, I mean, the one issue that really um, makes a person cluster B or even addictive, you know, I would say addictions, ADD, addictions, ADD, cluster B, all in the big bag. These are arousal disorders, okay? Arousal problems, okay? So basically, what does arousal have to do with the dialectic, okay? The quality of our ability, the quality of our dialectic, the quality of our ability to reconcile, to address, to deal with, okay, um, to... I don't know how to say it, like to synthesize even, you know, to reconcile with contradictory, frustrating, dissonant experiences, okay? And arousal. What does arousal have to do with our quality of our dialectic, okay? Basically, the proposition I have is that all the symptoms, the, the overlarge, the exaggeration, the, the grandiosity, the unlimited success, the excessive fantasy, these are all the product of dialectical discontinuities, okay? Basically, our, our dialectic, which should be a continuous, continuous process, kind of breaks away, okay? And that split is literally, I think, what we call splitting, and that causes things to be unreconciled, okay? And when there's no reconciliation, I believe things get exaggerated, okay? So basically, um, what we're seeing in the unlimited success, the grandiosity, the envy, all these things, 
we're seeing basically a lack. This is what humans are like when we don't reconcile. Okay, when we don't have dialectical continuity. Okay, so these are basically dialectical discontinuities that are produced by erratic arousal. Okay, so it's a, an arousal problem. Okay, so basically, I think this puts us very much on the level of addicts and ADD. Okay, and all the cluster B. Okay, I think we really have to, you know, start exploring more the core of this, which is not all the little symptoms, but it's the arousal. Okay. And, and hopefully if we can deal with our arousal issues, okay, that will allow us a steady state that will allow our dialectical processes to have more quality so that we can reconcile irritations, dissonances, frustrations and contradictions okay and granted we can look at this in the public you know in the subclinical range okay in the subclinical range a lot of americans in the united states are having a lot of trouble having dialectic between the different uh, political uh the political camps right the political parties and why might that be might it be that people are too aroused okay are we too aroused politically to allow for that discourse to allow for the uh, reconciliation, you know, we have to ask ourselves, maybe it's because we got the temperature too high and the country is so aroused, so intense, so edgy that that lowers the ability to have reconciliation. So we can look at the political environment, the overheated, you know, the pot, the pot is too high, you know, the, the temperature is too high. And we can see that as a model for what's really happening, you know, on, on a more personal level with cluster B people or with addicts or with ADD. The basically, on some in some sense, the arousal is too. I would say the arousal range is probably too too intense, and so that is causing um, discontinuity and that interruption of otherwise a healthier uh, dialectical process. Okay, so it's it's basically a dialectical failure. You know, and when I say failure, I, I just mean failure in the in the scientific sense, which is a degraded a degraded uh, dialectical process, okay? So when I say failure, I'm not saying absolute failure. I'm just saying basically it's a degraded dialectical process, okay? Which is the product of, um, you know, arousal dysfunction or, you know, what do you want to say? Like dysregulation, arousal dysregulation, okay? So basically, um, so what do we do about it, okay? And, and again, I can't hide that I'm frustrated because I wish I had known it like this, Okay, uh, you know, 20 years ago, that would really would have helped me out. It would have given me a, a strategy. Okay, but in in any case, you know, leaving that aside, um, how what are the problems with arousal? Now, now, granted, I am just exploring this. Okay, so I'm I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a neuroscientist, and and I have just I, I don't have a lot of experience thinking about this. So I'm also exploring this as I speak. So this is not authority. This is just me exploring hopefully motivating other people, maybe smarter people, people with more psychological background, that they can maybe also think about this and maybe give feedback or, or take it further, or maybe it's already being discussed, who knows. But basically, um, the the theory that I have, okay, is that, you know, I've, I've been kind of studying a little bit, trying to study a little bit about how the neurotransmitters work, okay? And I've come to the conclusion that probably it's not so simple, okay? I have a feeling that our, our how we feel, okay, is not just how much dopamine or how much serotonin. There's probably a lot of other factors from, from the research that I've done. Even if you have inflammatory processes in the body, okay, just inflammatory processes, aside from the dopamine, aside from the serotonin, those things can cause dysthymia, okay? There's also other neurochemicals, you know, very, very subtle neurochemicals aside from just the basic neurotransmitters that can also cause a, a lot of problems, you know, hormones, uh, endorphins, the, the endorphin family. This It's probably so complicated, like usual, as usual, uh, neuroscience is probably just way oversimplifying. So I think we shouldn't fall into the temptation to reduce our, our psychic wellness to just one or two neurotransmitters. It's probably a whole cocktail, and it probably has a lot to do with our whole body. It probably has a lot to do even maybe with just the I would even say the robustness of our nerves, just the nerves of our body. You know, maybe some people have more robust nerves. You know, maybe it even has to do with the fattiness of the nerves. Who knows? But basically, um, the bottom line is that I believe that um, the one thing I see in common with the ADD, 
with the cluster B and with the uh, addictions, okay, is generally a baseline, like a, like a basic uh, neurological baseline that tends towards irritability, okay, irritability. I really think that's part of it. And I think that um, probably with irritability, then on top of that, a habituation, just being habituated, not to have much tolerance, okay, for um, for contradictions, for um, for irritations, and for um, for dissonances, okay. Basically, things that are sort of uncomfortable, uneasy, okay. Basically, the the uneasy, uncomfortable kind of limbo, being in the in the gray zone, kind of in the limbo, basically. So basically, we're talking about. Um, uh, I guess the main word I want to say is dissonances, dissonances, discomfort, uh, irritation, okay? So if you're already irritable, okay, and if for some reason in your life you've already developed sort of a tendency to be sort of intolerant of discomfort, irritation, uh, frustration, um, contradiction, um, dissonance, okay, what's going to happen? We're going to get into a pattern where we're already irritable to, irritable to begin with, okay? So that's that's one thing, okay? And then when things are sort of uncomfortable, unsavory, unpleasant, irritating, itching, um, dissonant, we sort of have a, a habituation to sort of pop out of it really fast. Okay. 